Looks like it's live. Yes, I'm going to just uh, introduce him. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our seminar tonight. And thank you all for coming out in our April weather. Uh, it's going to get better. We know that spring is on its way, right? I'm Shirley Decker, and I'm the director of Roots and Branches. And this is Jenny Conley, who is. Uh, my assistant, and she's going to be introducing our speaker in just one minute. I have just a couple of things I want to say. Um, first of all, I want to introduce any of our board members that are here tonight. We have um, Mike Faulkner, who is our president, and he has an announcement that he wants to make to, to you. And uh, Susan Steinhoffel, who is in the back there, who is the chair of the seminars and brings, brings all these wonderful seminars to you. And I think, I don't know if there's anyone else, I didn't see anyone else come in that's on our board, but I wanted to introduce them. Mike has a, a quick announcement that he wants to make. So Mike, let me just wait for him a minute. You're like Secret Service. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, my name's Mike Faulkner. I'm the current president of Roots and Branches. And while we sort of had a, a great audience here tonight with all the people, I just want to make one quick announcement of something new that we're going to be doing um, this year with Roots and Branches. Um, on September 25th, we're going to be sponsoring a bus tour to um, China Lights at the Borner Botanical Garden. Um, I'm not sure how many people have been there before, but it's, it's, it's an awesome thing to see. And every year it's different. So even, even if you've been there in the past, you know, it, it's a, a different set up every single year. So um, we have West Bend Elevator will be our sponsor for the bus trip. It will be September 25th on a coach bus and we will have, um, it, the cost will be $40, it includes the ticket uh, for admission and the, the, the coach bus. And we just sort of finalized things yesterday with nailing everything down, but I wanted to announce it tonight. So just to, you know, put it on your calendars and um, soon there'll be an announcement on our website or, or different places 
uh, as far as how registration will work. You know, you'll most likely be talking to Jenny, you know, when you register and things. So we hope to, uh, capacity's 47 on our coach bus, so obviously we expect to fill that up. So you're the first ones to know about it. So um, that's, that's, that's what I have to say. And this is hopefully that we can have a lot of people come and, and it's gonna be a great time. It's, a, it's an awesome experience if you haven't seen it. And I think a lot of you have that are shaking your heads yes, I think you would agree that it, it's a great thing to see. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. You heard it here. I hope you're all getting excited about the idea. We've been talking about a bus trip for a number of years, and Mike and Susan have put their heads together and really come up with some ideas for beginning our bus trips in the fall and then maybe continuing them if they're successful. We hope that they will be. Um, I wanted to just say something about Roots and Branches very quickly, because I know that there are several of you who are new, and it's important to know, I think, what we do. We bring this to you free because we think I think it's an important part of our mission, which is to improve um, our communities uh, through improving the landscapes and the beautiful gardens downtown and generally uh, just improving the quality of life for all of us in our community. And we do this through all of our different events and activities throughout the year. And you got this uh, brochure tonight, and inside the brochure is a calendar of events which shows not only the seminars that will be coming up in June and in the fall, but other activities that we do like the garden tour and the plant sale and things like that. And there may be other things that you're interested in that we do. And one of the things that I wanted to mention to you, um, Jenny and I are both part-time people. And we just are just two little people here that that can't do it all. So what we really need is volunteers. And we have a lot of volunteers, but we never have enough to really go around. So we hope that you might consider participating with us as well as just attending something in the future. So I wanted to just tell, um, tell you about us a little bit so um, you have a little better sense of us. Uh, so thank you for coming tonight on this uh, rather cold, windy night, and I hope you enjoy this, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny to introduce our speaker. So I'm sure you don't wanna hear me talk some more, so I'll be very brief. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is pass around a clipboard to sign up for our next seminar, which is not until June 13th. It's gonna be Make Mine Mediterranean. It's an herbal cruise. It's gonna be with Carrie Hennessy of Johnson Nursery. The second clipboard, again, will be uh, suggestions. Let us know what you'd like to hear about for future seminars. It helps our chair determine what type of speakers in we will bring in for 2020. Can you believe it's gonna be 2020 already? Um, then I'm just going to introduce Shelly Coulier of Monarchs Unlimited. Uh, she's a member of the Herb Society of Wisconsin, Milwaukee Art Museum Garden Club, and is on the board of the Western Great Lakes Bird and Bat Observatory, an organization that supports the monarch butterfly, and she has a true passion for the monarch. So welcome, Shelly. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight talking about my favorite butterfly, the monarch. I... First of all, how did I get involved in this? It's an amazing story. I have an acquaintance, a veterinarian in 2011, who told me that she raised monarchs with her sons and tagged them for scientific reasons. I'd never heard of this. I thought it was amazing. I don't like bugs. And I thought, oh, but there is a crisis. This was 2011. And I thought, maybe I could help. And so she explained to me how to raise a monarch. And I raised one in 2011. I was absolutely taken with this butterfly in the process. I raised another monarch, and I was hooked. So 2012, 2013, it just, it all snowballed. I was raising so many monarchs. My garden was changing. My thinking was changing. and. I found out that you could actually go to the sanctuaries in Mexico and see these monarchs. And I investigated, uh, told my husband, I said, you know, we could go to these sanctuaries. It's not easy. It's a flight to Mexico City. Then you get on a bus and you go up in the mountains four hours. Then you get in a truck 
and you go further up in the mountains than you are at base camp where you get on a horse and finish the leg. I said, it's, I know it's not easy. Um, we, we do have to fill out a medical form. I said, but wouldn't that be fabulous? We would be surrounded by millions of monarchs. I mean, it would be an experience of a lifetime. And my husband said, are you insane? <laughs> he said, I don't want to go. I, I don't like this idea. And I said, oh, you know, that didn't surprise me. And I said, but maybe I could go. Maybe I could get a friend and we could go. And he said, Shelly, no. He said, for three reasons. Number one, you're going to get sick on the food and water. Number two, if you don't get sick on the food and water, you may fall off a mountain and end up in a third world hospital. Or number three, the largest drug cartel in Mexico is in Michigan. He said, no, absolutely, I, I can't let you go. And he was right. I thought, this was a bad idea. Christmas morning, 2014, I opened my gift, and it said, you are going to the monarch sanctuaries. I was just astounded. And the first thing I said was, am I going alone? <laughs> He said, no, I'll, I will go with you. So that's how I ended up in the sanctuaries. And I start with my very favorite picture, um, the, the monarchs on this Oyamal tree look like stained glass. Look at the sun coming through. It is so magnificent. And imagine all of these monarchs have been alive for eight to nine months. They flew that epic journey to Engangueo, Mexico. They then hibernated for months, woke up. They're now awake, but it's not over yet. They have hundreds of miles to fly back to the United States to Texas. So I start with that, but I want to make sure everyone knows how the monarch migration works. Oops. What? Oh, good. <laughs> um, each coast, the, the east and west coasts of the United States, those monarchs head south. And they hibernate the winter in Southern California and the southern part of Florida. The center section monarchs, 95% are from Canada, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. So we right here are part of that nursery uh, of monarchs that end up in Angangueo. So as I said, we land in uh, Mexico City. And at Customs, the walls are covered with these beautiful, charming murals and let me find the pointer here. Whoops. Yikes. I'm sorry. OK, so the pointer doesn't work. That's OK. Can you see the monarchs? They're all over the picnic table. They're flying in the air. Every single mural had a, a picture somewhere of a monarch. We checked into our hotel, uh, met our tour group from Natural Habitat. Uh, we had 12 people, two tour guides. Uh, they are affiliated with the World Wildlife Fund. We had the most delicious water lemon water with chia seeds. It was, I've tried to replicate it. I haven't yet, but I want to tell you the food, the water, absolutely delicious, not Mexican food that we know here in this country. The food was like French country. No one got sick on the food or the water. Next morning, we got on our bus and immediately went straight up in the mountains there were no ugly billboards. It was just a beautiful drive all the way. The only billboards were for the sanctuaries. Four hours later, we landed in um, Angangueo, Mexico. 
this restaurant is, can you see all the monarchs on the side of the building? This is the restaurant we had lunch in. And the bar area has a mural of Angangeo, the town center. You see the monarchs. And up on the wall are monarch pictures. There's their license plate. And charming pictures of monarchs uh, by local artists everywhere you went. Uh, this is the city plaza. Again, the monarch. I loved their sidewalks. They had monarchs. Isn't that just so charming? Here's a dentist office and his rendition of a monarch, which mirrors the miner's cap. He's giving a salute to their original base economy, which was silver mines. Here's a grocery store logo in Angangeo, and you can see the Aztec influence of that design. Here's Fernando, our lead guide. He's explaining this two-block-long mural hand-painted by an artist about the history of Angangeo. And he's showing the artist here who is painting pictures of monarchs. You can see on his artist's bench, you can see the specimens that he's making his drawings from. And what he's saying is that we all have to work together, Canada, the United States, and Mexico, to save this monarch that is in crisis. Here's our darling little hotel, very humble, very comfortable, and clean. Who's ever stayed in a pink hotel? Wasn't that fabulous with the, the darling monarch? And they had murals everywhere at the hotel. This is one of my favorite. It says, Circle of Life, Monarch Butterfly. And you can see to the left the, the caterpillars that are crawling up the trees to spin their chrysalis and then eventually em emerge from their chrysalis and fly away. And where are they flying to? The Blue Mountains of Angangale. So there's the truck. We hop in the truck, and I, I'm in the back, my husband, Fernando, some friends, and then those, the young couple in front, born and raised in Iceland, and we all agreed they were the whitest people we had ever seen <laughs> in our lives. They, they were just darling, though. And so, again, we're always going up. And at this point, there's no vehicles. It's all horseback or walking. We've um, managed to get to the base camp. We're unloading. And then there's the sanctuary entrance. It's so charming. Once again, the um, hand-painted rendition, in this case, the circle of life, showing all the different stages of the monarch. And then how fun. The muralist was there painting his rendition of an abstract painting of a monarch wing. Here's Fernando and Claudia, the second um, tour guide. They are selecting the horses. Now, I don't know if you can see from these pictures, the horses are shorter than our horses in the United States. And they're uh, bred for high altitude. They're strong. But I was worried about my husband. He's a tall guy, big guy. And I said to Fernando, I'm worried about my husband. I, I'm sure I have nothing to worry about. And he said, yeah, I'm worried too. It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh. So here is my husband. He's about as long as the horse is wide, at, but nothing happened. Everything went perfectly. Here I am at the top, ready to go into the entrance of the sanctuary. And uh, this is a flower that we have here in Wisconsin. It's a rosenweed. All the flowers that you're going to see here today are all on the list that is printed up for you. But imagine, again, this monarch has been alive for months, has flown thousands of miles, and now is, is headed back to the US. They're waking up, but this is the entrance. Some are flying out. It's the first week of March. They're starting to know it's time to leave. 
Um, this is a UN UNESCO World Heritage Site, so it is protected by the world. Armed guards, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Those armed guards are there for many reasons, but the main reason is poaching of the Oyamal tree because these people have no heat in their homes and they're cutting down the trees. You, you see the serious problem here. So signs, you have to be very quiet. You can't touch a monarch dead or alive. You can't use a flash. It looks like fall. No, it's spring. Those are monarchs. Here they are waking up. They are roosting on the Oyamal trunk. They get strength from the sun. And there's our little Icelandic girl. She carried this um, monarch on her head for more than an hour. Now, that was OK with the guards, because they did, the monarchs would roost on people. Uh, that's OK. You just can't touch them. Again, it looks like fall. No. It's springtime. And they're just waking up. So this is a very normal picture, and it's OK. It's part of nature. These are dead monarchs. They're on the floor of the sanctuary. But what I love about this picture is that these monarchs tried to make it. They went through that whole process of going from egg to caterpillar to butterfly. They made the thousands of mile journey. They hibernated for months. They got up, but they just could not make it. The trip back. They just couldn't do it. This is the end of the first day of three, three days in the sanctuaries, and this is exquisite. Those are Oyamal trees in the background, and this rosenweed is dripping with monarchs. Monarchs act like birds. They flock together to uh, migrate and so they're getting together just like birds right now and they're going to get eventually into a kettle what's called a kettle and they're going to be flying back to Texas so we got up the next morning for our second sanctuary and got in a bus one hour drive to our highest altitude 11,000 feet here, uh, we were gr greeted at the entrance with these moving, beautiful, abstract sculptures. But they represent something to do with monarchs. Can you guess what that might be? Anyone? They move around in the air. They represent the milkweed seed. And this represents the Oyamal pine cone. Kids can play on it. It's, it's just charming. So um, I don't have my pointer, but everything you see except the far left of the Oyamal tree is solid monarchs, most of which are sleeping. But you can see some are awake. So as I go up the tree, you see the bark on the far left, but the, the monarchs, you're seeing hundreds of monarchs stacked together for warmth. And here's monarchs that are a little ahead of the ones still sleeping. Again, this is um, hard to explain. It, Imagine hefty bags filled with monarchs. They're just huge, pendulous, um, amazing appendages that hang from the Oyamal tree. You see, they're a little busier today, waking up. We had perfect weather. Uh, the three days we were there, it was 80 degrees to 81, no wind, and no rain. Uh, whoops, sun shining. So they're, they're waking up here. And then this is, this is fabulous. Who has seen a butterfly drinking water? They're having their first sip in months, 
and butterflies can never land on water. They have to land on the mud or on a leaf or on a piece of grass, and that's exactly what they're doing here. And they suck the water up along with minerals and nutrients that are in the mud, and that is giving them strength to make that trip back. Oh, I just, okay, so we were to go to a third sanctuary, and Fernando, our leader, got um, a phone call the night before from a colleague who said, go back to the first sanctuary, forget the third, you won't believe what's going on. So the next morning we followed his direction, we went back to the first sanctuary, and so I'm starting here with Fernando is talking about two butterflies here, and we'll just listen. Oops. You will touch the fly carrying the female with you. The female, she closes her wings already, like accepting the male. The male is on the bottom. Enough energy or enough heat. There we go. Are the eggs fertilized right then, or does she wait until she finds milk? I think they're fertilizing right there. And then wait later. Correct. Correct. This is what we didn't see the other day, like for this long. It, this this process takes maybe an hour, maybe a few minutes. It really it really depends on the male. The female is like okay with that, <laughs> and we don't want to bother this male and female. Well, she's not helping. You, you see that? <laughs> see, that's the punchline. So here we are at a stream, and look at these monarchs drinking water. How, how thick they are. Here they are really flying. But you get an idea of these pendulous pods of milkweed that are just hanging there but look how they're starting to wake up. And look how many there are. I mean, they're just, each pod has hundreds upon hundreds of monarchs. There's Claudia with her earring. She's the other guide. And at this point, we're all covered in monarchs. And it, it was just amazing. Blue, green, and orange. Blue, green, and orange. So what happened next was otherworldly. Uh, we were the last group there. We were the last to uh, leave. And we were picking up our gear. And suddenly, imagine this. Millions and millions and millions of monarchs lift at one exact second and fly like a tornado out right in front of us, out the sanctuary. This is called a monarch waterfall. It is a phenomenon that few people ever witness. Fernando had seen it once in his lifetime. Claudia, the other guide, had never seen it. And while it was so shocking and we were unprepared, the shocking part was the noise. What was the noise? It was the butterfly wings. It was so loud. And we heard this roar of butterfly wings. It's just, I, right now I have goosebumps. I still cannot believe that I got to witness this phenomena. So fortunately for me, Fernando grabbed my camera as the example to everyone in our group. And he said, everybody, get your camera on video and follow me. And this is what we came to when we came out. That you can put your cameras on video and then walk. Put so, so it's snowing butterflies. It's, they don't hit you. They're like bats. They're flying all around. There's my husband and me and our group. And it was breathtaking. I can't even describe, these are all Oyamal trees, and 
he's going somewhere. We don't know where he's taking us, and you're going to see it in just a minute. There's the rope that no one can go behind or go across. And as we approach this spot, I'm thinking, oh, there's all kinds of clogs of dirt on the grass. But then once I got there, it was monarchs drinking water, drinking the dew off of the the vegetation and um, you can see the little bit of a stream there, the little brown stream. So then he had the presence of mind and he told everyone to do this. He turned around and filmed where we had been. So this is my last picture of the sanctuary. And I love this picture because of the blue sky, the cloud, the Oyamal tree, the brown um, ground, and then these gorgeous monarchs. I mean, it just takes your breath away. So that's the end of the sanctuaries. And the next one is the plants. And so since I got involved with monarchs in um, 2011, I have to tell you, I said to my husband, I, I think you know they can only eat milkweed. And I said, so we're going to have to plant milkweed. And he said, I will never have milkweed in my yard. We have two beautiful gardens. He loves this direction that I'm going as much as I do. There's more than 20 uh, uh, species of uh, milkweed in Wisconsin. These are the favorite, easiest to grow for us right now. The common milkweed, the uh, swamp, and the, the butterfly weed. And people are so worried about, oh, it's, it's invasive. Um, it's like mint. First of all, milkweed is an herb. It's a beneficial herb that has been eaten by Native American Indians for thousands of years. They use milkweed for rope and for a fishing line. It is a wildflower. It was the European settlers that named these plants that are on your list having the word weed after them. These are our native wildflowers. So here's how you solve that problem of them spreading, just like mint or chives or anything else. In May, in May, they're this tall. You pick them up off the ground. There's no root. There is no root. By June, yes, there's a root. And it's like a tree root but there's also already eggs on that milkweed plant. These monarchs are so desperate for habitat that they'll lay an egg on milkweed this small, which of course can't sustain it. I love this picture. She uh, wanted to contain her milkweed. Look, it's a specimen plant. And this particular plant is filled with hundreds of eggs and larvae and other, by the way, you'll see this throughout, other pollinators absolutely love milkweed. Um, did you notice? It's in cement. And in fact, my favorite milkweed um, comes out of the base of my house and doorway. I, I mean, you can really contain it. This is a Port Washington um, garden right at on a busy street. And the um, flower, has anyone smelled the flower of a milkweed plant? It is the most heavenly scent you cannot imagine. I, I'm not exaggerating. Remember in 2011, I didn't remember what milkweed lo looked like. I grew up with it in Kansas. It was everywhere. But it's been so eradicated. I, you can't find, well, you know, you can't find it. No one smelled this fabulous flower. But who would guess that the honeybee, it's their favorite flower. People come to my yard now and they think I'm raising honeybees. That's how extraordinary this experiment has been because 
I now have so many pollinators that I wasn't looking for. Did you know that the Native American ladybug is in crisis? When was the last time you saw this ladybug? They lay their eggs on milkweed. They're just, I've seen two since I started this in 2011. Uh, but all sorts of butterflies. A viceroy, these viceroys, I've only had one in all the years, and he's, he's licking up the, what I call honey, that drips from the flowers onto the leaf. Do you see it shiny? It's, it's just amazing, this plant. And this is butterfly weed, which I just was introduced to in 2017. It was the perennial of the year. And it's a, it's a fabulous plant. And look, do you see the monarch caterpillar hiding? They think they're hiding. Here is the um, butterfly weed with, again, the honeybee. The honeybee, all bees, we have more than 20 native bees in our state, which are all in trouble. So my husband loves bluebirds, and I, I said to him, because bluebirds dive for, into the grass for their bugs, and I said, let's try no chemicals. And um, not only do we have nesting bluebirds, and they're right now in the bluebird box in our yard, all these pollinators because who knew who ever thought about this when you buy your honey in the grocery store it's clover honey uh, all the bees are all over the clover and um, clover is a natural herb it's beneficial as are dandelions herbs they're beneficial people have eaten them the italians grow dandelion for their greens so this is my yard and it doesn't look too bad. I, you know, I am very careful with my husband. I, but here's, here's another bonus. The rabbits and the deer are eating my clover and dandelions and not my flowers. I was not expecting that. And it's, it's a really a joy to see them. I don't mind the rabbits and the deer now because they're not bothering my, uh, my garden. So we know that um, clover of all types is the first pollinator of spring. Dandelions are key to the livelihood of pollinators. And oh, there I am with my favorite milkweed. And it's growing out of the side of the house by that door jam. And that one plant, I, I get hundreds of eggs and larvae from. But point being, these are all heritage or native flowers. Mm -hmm. These flowers that I planted most of my life are what I call junk food for your pollinators. There's very little to no nectar. So this was my yard at one point. I loved my pink geraniums and my spikes and my vines, and it was hard to give them up. But this is what I have now. These are all heritage or native uh, herbs, flowers. Look at that honeybee. I mean, hummingbird. I mean, it's unbelievable how, by changing my environment a little bit, I've helped these pollinators dramatically. So has anyone heard of this annual? This annual was introduced to me last year at the Port Washington at the Forest Beach Preserve Plant Sale. Um, it's on May 19th. You, when you see this flower, you're not going to believe it. They, you can get it here at this plant sale. So I planted this, and I cannot tell you, every, it's the favorite of every butterfly and bee. Uh, now, I did raise those monarchs, but what's amazing is I set them down on the verbena, and they wouldn't move. They, they were there all night. 
drinking. Now, watch for the photobomb here. This particular butterfly has I had never seen in my life. It is, and this is last summer that it came to my house. This is a giant uh, swallowtail on the verbena. Did you see that monarch trying to scare him away? Okay, the same thing again with a yellow swallowtail. Who has ever seen butterflies fighting? Can you believe that? I mean, you will love this, that flower. I have this picture because on the far uh, left, we have a male monarch. How do we tell a male from the female on the right? The male has those two spots. Do you see the two spots? And then the female doesn't. And do you see the female has a thicker petticoat? than the male, and the female has thicker veins, black veins, than the male. So who knew that milkweed saved the lives of our military in World War II? Every life jacket, every pilot's insulated suit was filled with milkweed floss. And this is a gal who grew up in West Dallas, and she, every fall, along with hundreds of thousands of United States children, collected milkweed floss for these life jackets. And you can see on the left, th this is one school's example of all the milkweed floss they collected. They always brought it to the school. And this is D-Day. Every one of those men has on a milkweed floss life preserver. So could we do that today? if the US government needed to make these life jackets and insulated suits. No. And they didn't forget the military dogs and puppies. These are custom made milkweed floss uh, life vests. So there's a bird that loves the floss of milkweeds, but cannot get it. It is the Baltimore Oriole, but you will not see nests lined with milkweed floss much anymore because it's just not there. So this is a, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If you go on their website, you'll get all kinds of information. They are my hero right now. They are uh, targeting milkweed across the plains, and we're part of that. But you can see the circle around Wisconsin. That is the nursery. That's the key that they're targeting. And I love this because this is downtown, um, one of the busiest corners in Milwaukee. Look at the milkweed. Can you see it's all over by the tree? It's actually blooming in the picture on the, the left. The um, oh. Queen Anne's lace is not native, but it's a key flower for so many of our butterflies, including uh, the black swallowtail, which I'm also raising. And that's so fun. You can raise all kinds of butterflies, not just monarchs. This is an example of a company in Manitowoc. Um, you know how industrial parks are so beautifully coughed and, you know, all the chemicals put down, and I talked this guy into, now he happened to be my husband, <laughs> I, I talked him into, let's just put the sign up, you don't have to do anything, the wildflowers will grow, the, the milkweed will grow, and he said, oh, the mayor will get mad, um, I'll get cited, I'll be sued. He agreed, and what I love about this picture is that very first summer, there was milkweed, there was goldenrod. Goldenrod is an herb. It's a beneficial herb. Again, don't, I don't advise you to plant it in your yard, but be happy it's in our country because it is the last plant for all the pollinators before they hibernate or, or die. But at any rate, it's a native wildflower and herb. It is not a weed. But look, before and after. Isn't that, isn't that fabulous? Oh, and so the company, all the people wanted to know, what is this about? Who knew? I, I put together a presentation. Everybody was thrilled. They're raising monarchs and changing their gardens. This is a darling house I love on um, Main Street in Port Washington. No lawn. 
It's all for the butterflies and pollinators. This is one of my favorite stories. You know, I don't know what happened with my print, but it's not usually like this, how it's doubled over. Anyway, this is my daughter's group home in Port Washington. It is the ugliest yard I've ever seen. And I said to the owners, could I put in a butterfly garden? They said, sure. Look at that. That's the day it was planted. Uh, mid-June, mid, mid and you can see I have the sign up immediately with um, milkweed plants. And so the following September, three months later, I was getting, uh, well, it was so gorgeous. It, the big surprise was that in that first week that the milkweed was planted, I already had three eggs. Um, the people in the group home were raising the monarchs, they were thrilled. Uh, what I, I knew that would happen, but I didn't expect the staff. They all had to know, what's going on? What are these flowers? I want these in my garden. And so it did so well so that by the 1st of September, I said, I'm having a huge party, and I'm inviting all the group homes and all the staff and all the guardians, and we're going to have a celebration. So this is the night before the big party, and I'm cleaning up the garden. I love the monarch because that's not my monarch. He is migrating. You see the date. That monarch is headed to Mexico, but I love it because he's on this zinnia that I plant from seed, which you'll see a little bit more later. But look what I found that night. So what do I do? Ooh, do I risk that, I mean, that's candy to robins and cardinals and spiders and ants. I mean, uh, monarchs in the wild, only one in 100 monarchs live to become a butterfly. And that's one of the reasons why it's, it's nice for us to help out right now in raising them. So what did I do? I took the risk. He was there the next day for the party. I did take him home directly after the party, and I raised him. So... So here's a, a young man who lives there. Do you see the monarch in his hand? And then it's up in the sky. I don't know if you can see right up. I mean, it just, it was such a fabulous party. Of course, you have to have cake. <laughs> and I love this, the before and after, one year later. One year later, and you can see how I've confined the um, milkweed to one, one area and that's where I'm keeping it. The mayor heard about this at Port Washington City Hall. He came to me and asked, would I install a butterfly garden on the grounds of City Hall, which is right on Main Street? I said, yes, I was thrilled. And um, so I started unloading the plants, and right in front is um, immature plants uh, of common milkweed. But here's the shock. I went to my car to get the next flat. It had only been there 10 seconds. <laughs> this poor female, she has, of course, no milkweed anywhere. And this is only about a block or two from uh, Lake Michigan, which is a flyway zone. You know, that's their highway. And so right there, I got three, three eggs. And in total, that summer, I, I um, 27 butterflies released from that city hall. Now, that this particular mayor, he's not there right now, but he um, had taken the monarch pledge. West Bend can also be a monarch city. I showed him where to get the sign. It says Monarch uh, City USA. And this is one year later, right in front of City Hall. And I mean, it's filled with pollinators. And the people, when I'm working in the garden, the people who walk by, they just love to talk and say how much they enjoy it. So of course, I had to have a party at City Hall. And here I'm showing the kids how to tag. It's so easy to tag and release, so much fun. Uh, a monarch. This is what the tag looks like. And I love this picture because we all know bee balm is the favorite of bees, but not when the milkweed is in bloom. 
That's my garden, that's my milkweed, and all the bees are on the milkweed flower. They're not on the bee balm. This is a good example, the same bee balm. If that had happened years ago, I would be running to Stein's to get a chemical to put on my horrible mildew plants. But it's key food for the, the bees, all the bees. They're covering this. This is, of course, in fall. It's the end of the season. And I found out that the, the, all the pollinators, they love the deadheads. This is a spent fennel, and there's a fresh fennel. He could have eaten the fresh fennel. Same with the lamb's ear. I hate those ugly stalks. I always had those cut down. Guess who loves them? All, the, all of the pollinators along the ugly flowers. They like that, too. This goldfinch is eating the spent lavender, not the fresh lavender. Same with the cosmo, the spent cosmo not the fresh Cosmo. And this one is the ugliest purple, uh, you know, pie. And I wanted to deadhead it, but how could I? He's eating. He was there all afternoon. They do like, of course, fresh flowers too. Ironweed, uh, blue salvia, Walker's, uh, Walker's low cat mint is a huge favorite of hummingbirds. I love this. These two monarchs are passing through. So it's fall, and they love zinnias. These two monarchs were flying together, and they slept together on those two zinnias overnight. But this is, oh, I plant my zinnias from seed. And you see how flat, like lily pads they are? That's the key. These are heritage. These are the old time uh, heirloom uh, zinnias. I love this picture. It's taken in June, the first week of June, at Schlitz Audubon. But it's strange. What is strange? This is a, a monarch, a male that is so tattered. He is completely faded, but it made no sense to me. It's June. He came from another state. He was born weeks ago, maybe down in Oklahoma or southern Illinois. He had made it up to the Schlitz Audubon, laid eggs, and look where he's picking to die, on milkweed. I wanted to get a better shot, but I didn't want to invade his space. He was having such a hard time, of course, flying. And I just, it was so poignant, and I felt so privileged that I got this shot. So this is a female uh, in my yard, and she's going to lay an egg at the top of this milkweed, right there. <coughs> so th these are the different stages. The egg is very hard to see, but once you get used to it, you can easily identify it. The larvae eats the shell. It's so nutritious as soon as he's born. And then, of course, they grow so quickly. I talk to people who say, I have milkweed, but no monarchs. This is how you tell. There's been at least 10 eggs laid on this one leaf. So that's how they eat. This is my nursery, and I'm very particular because the veterinarian taught me how to raise them. I get virtually almost no deaths. It's very clean. You have the instructions here. But there's so many ways to raise a monarch. I'm sure people here have raised monarchs. Yeah. So uh, different than me, I'm sure. But isn't it fabulous, all the stages here? You see the caterpillar, the jay, the chrysalis as they turn dark and then they turn orange and that's right before they emerge. And then they have to drip dry like this. They drip dry. Back at Schlitz, what's wrong with this newly hatched butterfly? A bird got him. Nothing wrong. I observed him for more than 10 minutes. He flew beautifully. I believe he'll make it to, uh, that he made it to Mexico. They have no feeling in their wings. 
again, you can tell it's fall. They love asters. These are all pictures, rosenweed. These are all pictures from the Schlitz. But these three monarchs at the Schlitz are coming in for ironweed, which is right here. They could land on another flower, but they choose. They choose the ironweed. They love the ironweed. So I have the rosenweed and the ironweed in my yard, and I'm just releasing a monarch here. Luckily, my husband was standing right there. The monarch did not stay on the ironweed, but went right to my face. I didn't scream. It was so shocking. I like to think she was kissing me goodbye. <laughs> so there's my granddaughter. It just shows it doesn't matter your age. Everyone loves a butterfly, a monarch. It's universal joy to everyone. And with that, I'd like to end with my favorite butterfly cartoon. <laughs> so thank you very much. If there's any questions. If they can find milkweed, they stay and, and lay all their eggs. Okay. They're, they're in, if, if you have milkweed, they're not going to leave because there isn't any else around, really. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for, for planting it. Oh, it's wonderful. I love hearing that. But our milkweeds do not look like No, yours. they're smaller. We, li we live on sand, you know. That's okay. It all works. <laughs> and, and by the way, I have really short milkweed, too. I Remember, I talked about my favorite one. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay. yes. Uh, oh, they, they could never get back to my house because they die in Texas. So they fly to Mexico, hibernate, and then they fly back to Texas and die after, you know, mating. So then if uh, those have fallen, there must be others that have been made up in the What happens, um, it's, it's a great program, excuse me, <coughs> that the children, excuse me, the children in Mexico are paid $2 for every monarch that they find that's tagged. Their school teacher knows to mail it back to Kansas University. That's where the tags come from. I'm sorry, I'm just, it's, I'm talking so much, it's really hard on my, I do, but it, yeah. I'm sorry. Any other questions? I'll stay, yes. What month was that? It was September, I have a picture. Well, I'd love to see that picture. Um, they, they were migrating. Um, these, it, oh, this is, this is gorgeous. It's a female. It's a beautiful, beautiful composition, too. She's on her way to Mexico. And they, oh, yeah, they make it. Oh, did you say they were dying? Had there been a storm? Oh, see, I like to think that they got there. I don't, I don't think they were. Yes. We don't know. It's, it is a special fir tree, the Oyamal, and it it's, doesn't hurt. You can touch it. It's like ours can really be prickly. We don't know. And more trees are being planted, but they're being cut down. Uh, it's, it's a tragedy. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Two, there's been some reports where the numbers of monarchs have been 
about that? Yeah. Last year was a good year. Yeah. And it's, it's very good to hear because it's just been going down and down and down. This is down, down, and it's slightly up. I mean, it's still a crisis. It's still just heartbreaking. Because 20 years ago, we had over 1 billion monarchs. Today, we have less than 3 million. So to go from 1 billion, and we know that from the tagging and, and all different scientific um, research, it's a crisis. You know, I've tried everything. I've experimented all different ways. I, I think it's best to buy the plant. It's very hard to grow milkweed from seed. Now, butterfly weed is different. Butterfly weed that you saw with the caterpillar on for that party, I planted that with seed. Um, Butterfly weed doesn't mature until much later than the common milkweed. It, it matures in July. So you think it might be a weed and people pull it, but once you get it started, it's great. Yes? Just to add, add to that, common is really hard to grow from seed, right. but the red or the swamp milkweed is much easier to grow from seed. Butterflies like it nearly, monarchs like it nearly as much. And it's a perennial also. We'll That's right. Everything he said is right. Um, swamp doesn't grow in my yard, so I'm not familiar with that. But I, I know the two, you know, butterfly weeds. So that's good for me to know. Thank you. you now, because of the U.S. government's push, all garden centers are carrying it. Mm -hmm. So you can buy it. Can yes. They all carry it now because there's such a demand. It's... It's the only way we can help the monarch because the government, it has to come from each one of us. It's such a huge, overwhelming task. So I hope you will plant milkweed. It will enrich your life. Thank you. Thank you guys very much for coming and we look forward to seeing you at our up next one in June. Have a good night. Thank you. 